hi again, everybody. It's such a pleasure, such an honor to have Daniel Choi here with us today to tell us about his remarkable and ongoing history. So turning it over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Sri, Jasmine, and also Audit, who isn't uh, here in this current recording. But I, I'm really, really honored to be at a part of this table. And as I was saying before, I feel like less of a slide talk, more of a table talk, thinking in almost like a round table ask way, except the only reason why it's round is because my coffee table or my computer sits is round. So I actually, it's interesting how I feel like the, uh, kid at the adult table at those family gatherings and i've always been that way and i think this idea of tables is actually something that's very interesting when it comes to how scientific communities work because that's where my kind of experience from the research world has led to so currently i am a lecturer at the princeton writing program and there's a wonderful tradition that Princeton students have where they invite their professors to a meal in their dining halls and they just ask questions about it. And inevitably, they look at my bio, they see that I have a background in a biological physics, and they say, how did you become a writing professor? And the spiel that I give is essentially the trajectory that I have just memorized up to this point. Well, when I went into undergrad, I first decided that I wanted to do math, um, linguistics, and philosophy as a triple major. Then in my first quarter, I failed my real analysis class. But then I was taking chemistry at the time, and I thought, oh, I can use math to uh, look at the world. So I was a chemistry major for my first year. And then in second year, organic chemistry happened. And I failed that. And I thought, okay, well, at least there's physics. So I was doing physics and um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna be a physicist. Ooh, I love complex systems. I love theory. And then something called the physics GRE happened. And then I didn't get into any physics grad schools, but for some reason, Princeton's molecular biology department said, oh, we want you there. And then I apparently became a biologist. Although I would like to say that my dissertation which was on animal behavior, had very little to do with molecules or biology for that matter. So with all of that in mind, now that I'm a writing professor, I like to say to my students, no, I'm proof that you can get a PhD and you still don't know what to do with your life. So when you look at all of that trajectory, that seems like, oh, okay, he's a free spirit. But I think it's important that we take the time to really unpack some of the things that happened because while I've become very while I've been able to be glib about the story there is something within that story that I've been forced to re-examine especially in face of thinking about a living history what is my history and I thought that it's important to examine why I am currently not active in research but also not active in research whether it's at an academic level or at a private industry level. And why didn't I end up? Easy, I um, didn't fit in. But what does that mean that I didn't fit in? And this is where the writing professor in me comes into place. At first I thought it was a disciplinarity thing. So as I mentioned, I've kind of been wandering disciplines. I've just wandered from here to there haphazardly. And when I got to my biology PhD program, I thought, okay, well, I guess this is it. This is my life. What happened though was I found it very difficult to actually engage in conversations. And there was talk earlier about the different languages or the registers of language that make various concepts or various conversations accessible. Uh, in my first year prokaryotic genetics course, I which was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course, every night before that course, I would have an all-nighter just so that I can understand what the heck was going on in that paper. Because the last time I did anything with molecules or biology before grad school, believe it or not, was AP biology. And then, you know, physics of behavior, do I call myself a neuroscientist, a behavioral, an ecologist? 
do I call myself a physicist? And it was very difficult for me to find a space where I could talk about my research with people who were able to actually ask questions that deepened the research as opposed to, oh, but that's not really neuroscience, is it? That's not really this, or is it? And this type of, I don't want to call it gatekeeping because it wasn't necessarily that they felt threatened. If anything, they probably didn't think of me as anything very significant, <laughs> but they just didn't understand. And I was trying to figure out well, how do I help make them understand? Do I try to just give a little business card to them every time and say, all right, here's a primer, read this before you talk to me? And that became really, really um, exhausting. And it became very lonely because there I had no colleagues that I could really talk to. And even in my lab, I was the one person in the fly project, whereas everyone else, it was a biophysics lab, but everyone else worked on bacteria. So I was always in this weird position of being out there, out there, out there, out there, out there, out there. And I thought, wait, is this something to do with me? At, after a certain point, you start wondering, is this personal? And I know that, you know, there's a lot of conversation around identity politics and the power play. But for me, this was real life experience because I just could not figure out for the life of me why it was so hard to join that table. My advisor said that you have to live and breathe science if you want to make it in science. You have to be constantly thinking about science. And here I thought I was. But for some reason, why was there that connection? Was it because my vision of science was different? Did no one tell me that my vision of science was different? So in the end, instead of thinking about a big table with a great conversation going on, I saw myself as the lone new kid at school amongst a cafeteria where you already have those cliques. And um, basically I was Lindsay Lohan and Mean Girls. So this, is, this was just after a while I thought, okay, what is it? Is it personally about me? Is it my background? Is it the fact that at the time I was 245 pounds? Is it, is it because I'm gay? So I started questioning all of these things. And then in the end, I just couldn't figure it out. And then I thought, well, you know what? That's fine. I ended up having to give up because I just didn't have the energy anymore. But there was a place where I did find the conversations happening. And that was yet another place where you had an island of misfit toys. And it was in the writing program where we had discipline or professors from different disciplines coming in to teach writing seminar courses. And that's where I started hearing about this phrase, ways of knowing. There are different ways of knowing. And that became a lifeline for me because I saw, oh, look, because there are these different ways of knowing, there are different ways to approach what science is. It's not just lab science. If we look at science as a history, it was natural philosophy. It was the, um, it, if we think about the naturalists like von Humboldt, or if we think about um, Goethe and the Urflans, the this idea of a romantic conception of science, there's an entire history that we weren't taught. And furthermore, Looking deeper into it, I real I started seeing finding alternative systems of knowledge, where I started wandering, meeting teachers from Buddhist monasteries or Hindu temples, and I've learned even from them that they too have their own lineages, their own traditions of science. Cognitive psychology. Well, if you want to look at cognitive psychology, some of the deepest research you can find has been in the Abhidhamma, in the Pali canon of um, Theravada Buddhism. Combinatorics and bi binary numbers, these were things that a sage by the name of Pingala was wrestling with in order to understand how to generate prose or uh, poetry in Sanskrit. And here are so many different stories that are being told, so many different places where 
science existed. And then I thought, okay, so maybe it's not just, maybe it was just that I wasn't at the right cafeteria. Now, I don't think that it needs to be that way personally. I think that any new kid in any place feels a little awkward, feels judged, perhaps even analyzed. But we do know what that history of school rivalries are like. So just simply shifting to another cafeteria isn't the best idea, right? It's not going to solve anything because that puts the onus on the individuals who don't even know. They don't even know to ask those questions. So for those of you who have a seat at a table, that's an immense power. That is a power that determines who gets to sit with you and who gets to talk with you, who gets to eat with you. And for those of you who are still finding your own tables, sometimes you have these success stories of people fighting to find their table for their place at their table. That's not my story. That's not my story to share. So I can't give you insight on that. But if you're exhausted for f about fighting, that doesn't mean that it was you. It just means that there are other places that we need to seek out sometimes, and we need to amplify those other spaces, those other cafeterias. And I, going back to that Princeton dining table, or even this table that we're having here, the fact that our organizers were able to bring someone like me, who is not active in research science, still tell a story of how that world of research shapes the way that someone thinks and the way that someone interacts with the world. That is a powerful, powerful moment. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving, a, giving me the opportunity to share the idea of storytelling by the use of tables and when it comes to science. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dan, on behalf of the audience. That was powerful. Anybody with questions, uh, please feel free to unmute and uh, directly ask. Um, can I go ahead? Of course. Um, uh, there are two things that kind of strike me, what you said about like, um, if you're an interdisciplinary researcher, uh, even many of the academician who are not in sciences, they confuse about what the things you work on, um, the other ask is, is this, is this like, for example, in biophysics, people ask, is this biology or is it really physics? Um, my, uh, my question is, how do you think that approaching that sort of problem is uh, needed for the present scenario of like educational curriculum? Um, and also individually, like how individually, how you should approach this problem. And the second thing is, Part of the things that I find that many of the research fields that have been popularized or being popular, so people think like, you know, astrophysics or cosmology is like great and kind of matter, nah. So I th also find, uh, find kind, kind of thing that maybe because during that time, people considered or the media or people in the scientific field considered Einstein as genius. So even people didn't know what he was working on, people were like kind of, you know, excited about it and everyone wanted to know about what, what he's working on. So that's how gave the science, you know, uh, more popular. Do you think that that sort of approach is needed right now in biophysics or that sort of approach is, is not obviously a good idea? <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. This is actually something that I'm thinking about constantly and it's, I think the question is difficult to answer in a singular form because there are two components. There's what has to happen at, what can happen at the individual level and what has to happen at a systemic level. At an individual level, um, you can say that I'm an example of one choice that you can make, you just drop out of the conversation. <laughs> but for me, that actually provided me a new way of looking at this conversation and perhaps return to it. And one of the ways that the individual can approach this is as long as you don't lose your own spark for that passion, for whatever it is that you're researching, even if that changes, 
as long as you don't use nouns to describe yourself, you can go about that. What has to happen at a systemic level? Well, we need to have more conversations just like this one. We as a discipline, as a field, biophysics, we need to be able to say, what is it that we're actually doing here? And as you mentioned, we need more celebrities. <laughs> we need more publicizers, because here's the thing, the framing of any, any uh, disciplinary understanding, that is influenced by public perception, which influences policy, which influences funding. So communication, science communication, even if that's not a, even if that's not a profession, every scientist, I think, can do more to become a communicator and biophysicists especially have an advantage here because we're talking about how very simple rules can lead to such beautiful complex phenomena. The romance is on our side here. Well, on that very, very high note, thank you so much again, Daniel, on behalf of the audience and thank you so much for the question. Um, I am closing the recording momentarily.